Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the New York Historical Society. I'm Kat Schwartz, Deputy Director of Public Programs. And I would like to thank you for joining us, whether you are here in our beautiful Robert H. Smith Auditorium or watching via live stream. Tonight's program is a special presentation featuring a talk on the winning book of the 2022 Gilder Lehrman Prize for Military History at the New York Historical Society. We're thrilled to continue our partnership with the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History on this prize. It is thanks to the leadership of Lewis E. Lehrman, who is joining us tonight via live stream, and the late Richard Gilder that we have joined together for the presentation of this award. I'd also like to thank and recognize New York Historical Trustees joining us tonight, Russell Pnoyer, Jean Margot Reed, and Michael Solander, and all of the Chairman's Council members joining us for their great work and support. Tonight's program will last an hour and include a question and answer session. The Q&A will be conducted via written questions on note cards. You should have received a note card and pencil as you were entering the auditorium, and my colleagues will be circulating in the auditorium and collecting cards later in the program. If you are joining us via live stream, you are welcome to submit questions using the Zoom Q&A function. Although there won't be a book signing following this evening's program, signed copies of Mr. Henderson's book will be available for purchase in our NY History store on the 77th side, street side of the building. Um, Craig Simon's books will all also be available for sale, as well as um, our other finalist books. I would now like to welcome James Basker, president of the Gilder Lehrman Institute, who will introduce the prize and this year's winner. We are so grateful for all the good work Dr. Basker has done for both of our institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. And um, I want to thank also Louise Mirror and the board of the uh, trustees of the New York Historical Society for hosting us here tonight. I want to say welcome to everyone in the room and those joining us uh, remotely on the live webcast for this 10th um, offering of the Gilder Lehrman Military History Book Prize, a $50,000 award for the best book of the year on any aspect of American military history from the colonial period to the 21st century. This prize was created 10 years ago by Lewis Lehrman, who is the co-founder and co-chair of the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History. Lou, as you've heard, could not be with us uh, this evening for health reasons, but I know he is watching on the webcast. So I want to extend a special thanks to Lou uh, for creating this prize, one of the many brilliant ideas and projects Lou implemented at the Institute, which in 2024 will be celebrating its 30th anniversary. I want to also recognize for a moment two of the trustees from the Gilder Lehrman Institute, Russell Penoyer, who's also a board member here and uh, Bob Niehaus and thank them for their support. As many of you know, the Gilder Lehrman Institute is the leading nonprofit organization devoted to improving history and civics education in K-12 schools and beyond at the national level. We now serve 35,000 affiliate schools in all 50 states, involving about 90,000 teachers and the 10 million students in their classrooms. For those of you who'd like to know more about what we do, uh, you're welcome to come and talk to me after this program or shoot me a, an email. But I would like to give a shout out to a group who represent um, that affiliate school network, and that's the students who are here tonight from Eximius Prep and their teacher, Joe Costello. Thank you both for joining us. It is a measure of the strength and popularity of the field that this year we had 98 books nominated for the Military History Prize. The hardworking jury who reviewed and evaluated all those books over the past year was made up of three historians who are distinguished in their own right. Uh, Lauren Foote, who is the uh, couldn't be with us tonight, but is in Texas, I hope watching in. Uh, she's the Patricia and Bookman Peters Professor of History at Texas A&M University. Kevin Weddle, who is here tonight, is Professor of Military Theory and Strategy and the Elihu Root Chair of Military Studies at the Army War College. And importantly, he was last year's winner of the Military History Prize. The chair of that jury was Craig Simons, Professor Emeritus 
at the U.S. Naval Academy, author of 20 or more books, and winner of countless awards, including in 2010, the Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize. And I want to thank those three jurors for the outstanding job they did this year in reading through all of those books and producing such a strong pool of finalists. Thank you very much. There are also, thanks are also due to the members of the board of the Military History Prize who, who once they receive the three finalists chosen by the jury, make the final decision. In addition to Lou Lehrman himself, two of them are here in the room tonight, and I want to thank them as well, Griff Norquist and General Michelle Johnson. Thank you both for your help. This year, the jury reported to us that it was a field of exceptionally strong books. I want to recognize the other two finalists for the prize who are here tonight um, by turns, and their books were also outstanding. First, Frederick Liner, whose book uh, is entitled Prisoners of the Bashaw, the 19th, uh, the 19 month captivity of American sailors in Tripoli, 1803 to 1805. Um, and was published by Westholm uh, Publications. And the other finalist, Nicholas Reynolds' book, Need to Know, World War II and the Rise of American Intelligence, published by Mariner Books. Congratulations to you both for your outstanding work. Thank you. It is now my privilege to introduce the winner of this year's Military History Prize, Bruce Henderson, author of Bridge to the Sun, The Secret Role of the Japanese Americans Who Fought in the Pacific in World War II, published by National Geographic Books. Bruce is himself a veteran of the US Navy who served in the era of the Vietnam War, and now a prolific and award-winning writer of more than 30 books of history, several of them, including this year's winning book, having hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list. His previous book, also a New York Times bestseller was Sons and Soldiers, the untold story of the Jews who escaped the Nazis and returned with the US Army to fight Hitler, which tells the little known saga of the young German Jews dubbed the Ritchie Boys, whose families sent them out to Nazi Germany, uh, sent them out of Nazi Germany to safety in America, and who returned as soldiers to Europe at enormous personal risk as members of an elite US Army unit to play a key role in World War II. All of Henderson's books have these same admirable qualities, compelling and often little known stories, extensively and rigorously researched, then told with superb narrative skill and deep human interest. The book we honor tonight, Bridge to the Sun, is one of the last great untold stories of the Second World War. It is a gripping true tale of courage and national service. The saga of the Japanese American US soldiers who fought in the Pacific theater against Japan, their ancestral home, even as their families home, back home in America were being rounded up and held behind barbed wire in government internment camps. Highly valued as expert translators and interrogators, these Japanese American soldiers operated in elite intelligence teams alongside army infantrymen and Marines throughout the Pacific, from Iwo Jima to Burma, from the Solomons to Okinawa. Bridge to the Sun reveals in riveting detail the harrowing and largely forgotten story of the Nisei and their major contributions to the Pacific War through six Japanese American US soldiers, the individual stories. After the war, many of these Nisei became translators and interrogator, interrogators for war crime trials and later helped to rebuild Japan as a modern democracy and a pivotal US ally. In a moment, we're going to enjoy a conversation between Bruce Henderson and the jury chair, Professor Craig Simons. But first, I wanna ask Bruce to come up and accept this year's Gilder Lehrman Military History Prize and a check for $50,000. Bruce. Probably to Penal. It's Penal. I'm sorry, I don't know. You'll correct me. <laughs> and, we, and we have a, a presentation that I think you had earlier. Yes. We don't have it in the room. Okay. But thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to call Craig Simons up and we'll go with the conversation here. Thank you both.
You hear us? Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Kat. Thank you all for coming out tonight. We appreciate it very much. Uh, thanks, of course, to Bruce and his fellow finalists who are in the room tonight. Um, and welcome to our discussion of Bruce's book, the subtitle of which is The Secret Role of the Japanese Americans Who Fought in the Pacific in World War II, but secret no longer. Um, I am, as Jim mentioned, Craig Simons. I uh, am Professor Emeritus at the U.S. Naval Academy, an occasional presenter here at the New York Historical Society. And I chaired the committee, and I want to add my thanks to Jim's, to Lorian Foote, and to Kevin Weddle, who is here tonight. Kevin, I cannot see you out there, but I assume you are somewhere in that darkened class. Um, his book, which I will also mention in passing, is about the Battle of Saratoga, uh, called The Complete Victory, but complete spelled in the 18th century sense, so that it looks like compliat. If you're looking for it in bookstores, you can find it. Okay, The Complete Victory. Um, with me here on the stage is Bruce Henderson, whom you just heard, uh, is an award-winning journalist, written more than, well, I have written here more than 20 books. I just heard more than 30, so he writes fast, apparently, between the time I wrote this one. Um, and in addition to that, uh, I, I'm going. I'm willing to overlook the fact that as a UCLA grad myself, he also taught journalism at USC. So whether that deserves a round of applause, I'm not sure. Now, Japanese Americans who fought in World War II is not, in the whole, a new story. Many people have heard of. Maybe many, most of you perhaps have heard of the 442nd Regiment of the U.S. Army composed entirely of men of Japanese ancestry who fought in Italy and then in France and remains today the most highly decorated unit in the United States military history with 4,000 bronze stars, 4,000 purple hearts, and no fewer than 21 medals of honor. But until I read your book, Bruce, I knew virtually nothing about the Japanese Americans who fought in the Pacific. Now, I have a list of questions here for Bruce. He's getting nervous, I can tell. Um, but I'm going to ask him in a minute. But I do uh, want you also to be thinking about things you might like to ask Bruce. And on those index cards that you have, if you'll jot down your questions and someone will be circulating to pick them up. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll talk for about 40 minutes or so. And then you'll have a chance for 15 minutes or so. So, Welcome, Bruce. Thank you. Congratulations on your wonderful book. Thank you. I want to start with a few terms. Um, we heard Jim use this term. Can you tell us who were the Isai, Nisai, and Kibai? And I hope I pronounced those correctly. Uh, the first two, yes, Kibi. Where's the third one? Okay, thank you. Uh, Isai, Isai were the Japanese immigrants who came to the United States, mostly to the Western states, and they were uh, remained citizens of Japan, partly because they couldn't legally become naturalized American citizens. There were laws against that back then. And their offspring were the Nisei, which is the first born uh, Japanese Americans, the ones that we're now talking about who came of age during World War II. And the Kibe, which is a uh, term, the uh, translation of it is to return, and that's the Nisei who their parents sent to Japan for two or three years to get education there, to learn the culture, to learn, uh, meet the relatives, to uh, immerse themselves in the language. And it was very common then for the Japanese immigrant parents to do that, particularly their sons and particularly their eldest sons. Now, the sons weren't always really happy about that. And sometimes they stayed for a year or two, sometimes longer. Every All of those in my book are um, the six major characters I follow are Nisei, who also were Kibei. And they went to Japan and returned before the war. And we'll get into why they were so sought after by the U.S. Army. Well, being sought after by the U.S. Army, I'm going to assume because of their linguistic skills and their cultural understanding, they would be useful in terms of reading captured documents, interrogating POWs. Absolutely, all of the above. 
but there's some ironies here because after Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, of course, there was this uh, his mass hysteria already fed by the anti-Asian rules and laws on the books. Uh, but that, of course, led to mass internment and whatnot. But the most uh, valuable uh, Nisei, if you will, were those that were initially considered the most suspicious because they had been to Japan. They obviously must love the emperor, which was not the case. These were American boys who went over for a year or two or three or more, but wanted to come back and did come back and were Americans through and through. But because they had gone to school in Japan, they knew the language, they could read it, they could, uh, of course, speak it well, write it. And uh, the fellows, the Nisei, who didn't go to Japan, only about 10% of the Nisei were actually uh, fluent in yeah. Japanese, which did surprise the army. They just assumed everybody who's Japanese American is going to know Japanese. It wasn't the case. You know, it's very interesting because a lot of immigrants, I mean, then and now and even earlier, uh, often have an aspiration to leave the old culture behind, to refuse to speak the old language at home and to acculturate their children immediately so that they can become American uh, right away. But 10%, you say roughly, decided it was important to them to send their children and only male children? Back Generally, to I've actually not didn't come across any of the sisters who, yeah. uh, or their daughters that went over there. Um, it's a cultural thing, I think, for them. But there was certainly something about those particular immigrant parents who wanted their sons to appreciate where they came from. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was, you know, an immersion in the old country as far as the kids were concerned. They were, As I say, they weren't always totally uh, uh, on board with it, but they did what their parents asked them to do. So when they came back uh, with this new acculturation, with these new linguistic skills, how easily or not did they fit back into the American society they'd left? Well, that's a good question. It depended on how long they were gone. I mean, one of my one of my characters was gone, was in Japan, much to his chagrin for 10 years. He kept wanting to come back. His mother kept saying, well, you know, his mother was really for the education. Uh, you go there, stay there, go to high school there. And they had a very good educational system in Japan with a couple of caveats. Uh, and then he did very well and he qualified to go to an elite college in Japan. And she said, oh, stay and go to college there. And he really didn't want to. And he borrowed money from a sympathetic aunt in Japan and got on a boat and came home without the family, you know, and until he called and said, you know, come and get me. <laughs> and that was about a year before the war broke out. And so lucky for him, he got out of there. And I might say there were several thousand of these Nisei kids who were in Japan when the war started and never got out. Uh, and in some cases were drafted into the Japanese army and treated really uh, uh, badly because they were Americans. And, but you know they used them as cannon fodder and whatever. Wow, so Americans to the Japanese, but Japanese to the Americans. Right. You know, the elephant in the room here is uh, Executive Order 9066, which was uh, issued in February 1942, giving authorization for the rounding up and removal of more than 110,000 Japanese Americans from the West Coast of the United States and put into inland collectives, which can really only be called concentration camps. Um, could you talk just a little bit about the motives behind this, why FDR signed this order? Uh, was it perceived as necessary? Was it necessary? Well, absolutely, it was not necessary. And there was not a single case of sabotage by a Japanese or Japanese American uh, in the continental United States or in Hawaii at all during the war. Uh, FDR was pressured by not only the military, but also uh, uh, because of politics, because of public opinion, the newspapers, everybody thought that these Japanese, uh, uh, ethnic Japanese, mostly living again on the West Coast, there were about 130,000, 140,000 uh, people of Japanese descent uh, living in the, in the United States. And uh, about 110 of them lived in the West, on the West Coast. And in fact, they ended up uh, interning about all of them. But um, he signed it for that reason. But the, the interesting thing is he never, the Japanese were not named 
in the executive order. No group was named in the executive order. The military, though, the U.S. military was given carte blanche, if you will, to um, uh, exclude anyone from the military area number one that is set up by the executive order. Now, the military area one was all the western uh, state, well, the western part of California, Oregon, and Washington. Now, the fellow who ran that is a general named DeWitt out of San Francisco. He made the statement a month after the executive order was signed to a visiting congressman saying, a Jap is a Jap. I don't want any of them. They're dangerous elements. And he is the one that, dis that issued the order that military area won. Therefore, we are going to exclude all Japanese, whether they're immigrants, Issei, or whether they're American citizens, Nisei. And that's how it started. That's so we're going to talk about some specific individuals here in a minute or two. But just to generalize for a moment, imagine being in one of these camps surrounded by barbed wire, often in, in unhappy areas, desert environment most of the time. How do those people end up in the United States military? Are they subject to the draft? Do they volunteer? How does this work? Well, initially, within about two months of the uh, start of, well, of America being in the war and uh, within two months of Pearl Harbor, uh, they stopped drafting Japanese Americans. And in fact, anyone who uh, had a 1A, uh, most of those who had a 1A were then redesignated to 4C, which was unfit to serve due to hmm. being an alien, being a, a hmm. citizen of another, of a, of a country that we're at war with, which of course was not true because the Nisei were Americans. But they, um, uh, th so the military, about three months into the war, putting together the campaigns that would be in the Pacific realized we needed language skills and the army needed to have people who could speak and most importantly, read Japanese to be in the Pacific theater, to read captured documents and enemy plans to interrogate prisoners that are taken. And so where are these people who speak Japanese? Surprise, they're in the camps. Well, let's go ask them to volunteer. <laughs> So, you know, you can understand that not there was a real a lot of bitterness in, in the folks in the camp. We're saying, now you come and we're here behind Bob Wire. And by the way, those camps, if you don't already know this, there's pictures in my book. They had gun towers. And I looked at those pictures. Gun towers manned by U.S. soldiers, Caucasian U.S. soldiers. And the guns were turned inward to the camp, you know, not outward. They were worried about people getting out. And yet these, when the military came in and it was a military intelligence service that said, we need volunteers uh, to go to a school for six months, you know, learn how to interrogate, you learn you know, uh, the army, the Japanese army uh, field manual, we're gonna teach you. Now we want volunteers, please sign up. Well, you know what these guys did? Most of them, they did. They signed up, they volunteered. Now, not everybody in the camps did, and there was some opposition, and they were called no-no boys, and they were just some saying, are you kidding? I'm not gonna do this. Um, but but they volunteered, and they they went to fight for this country that you know, had their family behind, behind um, barbed wire fences. Other US soldiers went to fight, and they left, they left their mom planting victory gardens and their sweethearts and wives and sisters working in uh, shipyards and uh, aircraft plants. And these fellows went leaving their families behind barbed wire fences. Was that category 4C applied to Italian Americans or German Americans? No. And in fact, the again, the, uh, the Japanese had the face of the enemy in the Pacific. I don't think you can say the German Americans or Italian Americans had the face of the enemy. Some of them had the names of the enemy, but uh, there was, I think, more of an assimilation of the on, of those types. Certainly, more of them. But I, this was a racial thing for the Japanese, pure and simple. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking of German Americans like oh, I don't know, Eisenhower, Nimitz. But anyway. Yeah. So what kind of training did they get? I mean, obviously the desire that the army wants is their skill in language and intel, 
Did they get military training? Did they carry weapons? Yes, they were combatants. In addition to going to this six month military intelligence language school, um, they were they went to basic training. They uh, qualified on the range. They carried weapons in the field. They were, my gosh, these guys were everywhere in the Pacific, Iwo Jima, Guadalcanal, the Philippines, the Solomon Islands. You couldn't be there, you know, in that situation and not be armed. And they certainly were. Uh, at the, on the other hand, they they were there to do this other job, and they were taught that in. But what has been described to me is a basically a two year college course in six months. Uh, it was not only Japanese uh, uh, grammar, uh, not only the the Japan learning the Japanese army terms, but also the U.S. Army terms, they had to be able to identify equipment, ammunition, tactics, uh, strategy. They also were given lectures on Japanese history, culture, and it was a tough program. And not, you know, and there was there was a failure rate, and those that failed uh, went back into well, they were, didn't go back to the camps, but the army found something else for them to do. They they had to get through this six month program, and uh, it, it was um, so when they left there. They were then put in 10 and 12 man intelligence teams that went into the Pacific and were assigned basically to every combat unit and headquarters. MacArthur had 400 of them with him in Australia, and they were reading captured documents that were coming in off the battlefields in the Pacific and, and being sent to, down to Australia. And of course, they were also in the front lines. The reason they have to be in the front lines is if you catch a prisoner, that's the best time to interrogate them is brand new, uh, not two weeks or a month down the road. Firstly, because you want to know what tactically is happening, where's the minefield or whatever, but also because they're most vulnerable then. They want to be treated. They want to be, uh, their wounds, they want to have them treated. They want to be fed. And, and they were doing, the American troops, of course, would do that. But they're also, that's when they want to get information from them. So they had to be there. You know, that provokes two questions from me, one of which is, I'm imagining a Japanese POW, and Japanese did not want to be taken prisoner. They would, they would fight and, and prefer to be killed rather than be taken prisoner. But those who were taken prisoner, to, be, to sit at a table and have someone come in with their face and talk to them in their idiomatic language, I mean, what an impact that must have had. It, it really did. And uh, the, the Japanese prisoners that were taken uh, were shocked at how well they were treated. Mm. They fully expected to be tortured, to be killed, and were shocked that they weren't. And, uh, and you know, the American and the uh, um, Japanese Americans interrogators would say, you know, we're here to take care of you. We're going to do this. We'll let the Red Cross know that you're that you're off the battlefield. And uh, no, don't tell anybody. <laughs> I don't want my family in Japan to know that I that I'm a prisoner. Better that they think I died. It was so shameful for them to be captured. And that's why, and actually that's one of the reasons why they dis disregarded, you know, prisoners that they took. I mean, culturally it was, if you're captured, you're shame on you. And you, you, you know, you're, and that's, you know, so that was, uh, I thought an interesting uh, reaction that they yeah. would get. The other question it provokes is these are Japanese looking people in an American uniform in a jungle where it's dark and it's crowded and it's confusing. Was there any concern about the fact that they might become victims of friendly fire? Well, absolutely. There was concern on, on that part. Can you imagine? I mean, one of my characters was at Iwo Jima and, and because he was, because of his language skills, they pushed him up in, in, in one of the front, you know, from one of the front uh, uh, advanced units. And uh, so there he is in the sands of Iwo Jima with a Japanese face in a Marine uniform. And they uh, had assigned him a tough Marine Sergeant to be his bodyguard. Hmm. And thank God they did because the, the second day that he was there, the word went out that the Japanese were stripping the uh, you know, the uh, battle fatigues off of dead Marines, putting them on and infiltra infiltrating the lines. So if you saw a Japanese in a Marine uniform, shoot him. And so here's our guy trying to do what he's supposed to do there, not only worried about being shot by the enemy because he's a Marine, but, um, but being shot by his own, by his own folks. Now you pick a handful, six or so, six to eight 
uh, characters who are featured help carry the story. How did you pick the six? Boy, that's a very good question. And it's not an easy thing to do. I probably had uh, 12 or 14 that I was looking at, but it had to do with what kind of source materials I had. And in fact, of the six fellows that I write about, only one of them was still alive when I started the research. And I only really had one interview with him. He's age 99. Um, oh. And um, and before he died, but it requires oral histories that they have given earlier when they could recall events. It requires uh, original correspondence, uh, un published or unpublished memoirs that they've left. Uh, there has to be this body of material because I'm not just writing a book about um, that's a military resume. I'm writing, I want to know what their thoughts and feelings are and what their fears were. And I'm not, I'm not making that up because it's nonfiction. And um, so I have to have that body. So there were some some fellows who I looked into and spent months talking to and, you know, with and and just had to not include because it wasn't enough. And there was also a finite number. The way I wanted to approach this, I was I wanted to have all of them follow each one of them beginning before the war and then going through the war. And so 12 would have been too many. You, I think the reader would have gotten lost. Three would have been too few. So I don't know, six seemed the right number. Okay, that makes sense. The other organizational problem that you had to overcome is that in order to tell their story, you also had to tell the context, the, the military history in which they were embedded. And you had your reader had to learn enough about what was going on here to appreciate and understand the role that your particular character was playing in there. I, the story of uh, Roy Masumoto is, uh, ab to me, absolutely amazing. And I hope you'll say a little bit about him. But in order to tell that story, you had to kind of tell quite a bit about the campaign in Burma, too. How did you make that distinction? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I can't just drop these guys, you know, in Burma or on Iwo Jima without explaining why they were there and what they were doing there. And, you know, I'm not, I, it's not that I want to write about military str strategy. Uh, I, I don't really, but I have to uh, take in some of it for the context that we need for this, for this character. And um, so, you know, it's a balancing act. I don't, I don't want too much of it because I'm not writing. I couldn't do a third of the book on Okinawa. But boy, when I have my one of my guys in Okinawa, I got to have a, enough there as to where what was going on there, and uh, you know why he was there and what they were trying to accomplish. And what about Roy Matsumoto? I mean, I, Roy Matsumoto's uh, ended up with uh, Merle's Marauders in in Burma, and uh, uh, what a story that is. The war in Burma was uh, um, was was particularly uh, horrific, and he was with fourteen. Nisei, who were assigned to the th roughly 3,000 uh, soldiers under uh, in Merle's Marauders. And uh, he, he, he did a couple of things, he became known as the hero of his battalion. But and one of them was he saw uh, they were in the jungle because they were always in the jungle there, mm -hmm. uh, a, a telephone line uh, up above. And it, uh, he climbed a tree and tapped into it. And it was, it was the Japanese troops talking and he was up there for a 24 hour period without coming down until he heard that there was some sergeant in an ammunition depot that was saying, you know, I think the, uh, the Americans are around here, send, send some more people. I only have three guards here to defend this. And the guy on the other side, all in Japanese, of course. Uh, all right, well, tell us again where you're located. <laughs> well, so Matsumoto, who had the same map as the Japanese, which was a British map, they were the only ones that had mapped Burma, uh, you know, marked it and they called it in. And the next morning there was a single airplane that came over and dropped one bomb right bang on the ammunition dump and blew everything up. Uh, but that's not why he was the hero of the battalion. Uh, the battalion got surrounded on a mountaintop by a, by a much larger force and days and days had gone by and they couldn't get reinforced. And uh, they were expecting a a huge assault to try to take them out. And uh, Ray, Roy Matsumoto, uh, one night started taking off all his gear and his helmet. And uh, he put on, he had two hand grenades strapped to his 
chest and 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 he told the lieutenant he was going to crawl out and get as close to the lines as he could they heard a lot of japanese chatter out there like they were getting ready to do something in the morning and the lieutenant said why why two hand grenades roy and he said well one's for them and one's for me um, they knew these guys knew that they could not be captured by the japanese army uh, they would not there was no way in, that they would be treated like a POW. Uh, they would have been traitors and it would have been, you know, terribly abused. So they weren't going to allow themselves to be taken prisoner. But he crawled up close enough and they were preparing themselves for the next morning, uh, having some uh, having some sake and getting a lot of loose lips. And he got enough information and he crawled back through and told them where, told his guys where exactly they were going to come from. And they set up the defenses. They had empty uh, foxholes that were wired to explode. And they backed up and they set up their lines of fire. So when this force came up in the morning to wipe them out, uh, it didn't happen. And this battalion was saved. And so every, every reunion for the next 50 years that the Merle's Marauders had when Matsumoto showed up, he was the hero of the battalion. He saved them. That was the kind of thing that these guys were trained to do and wanted to do. It wasn't always about winning battles, but it was always about saving American lives. Well, you start the book with, uh, here we go, Kazuo Komoto? Kazuo Komoto, yes. Okay, close enough. Um, uh, who spent 10 years in Japan, literally half his life before mm -hmm. he came back to be an American and a volunteer for the United States Army. There's a photo in your book of Komodo shaking hands with Eleanor Roosevelt. Yes. How did that come about? Isn't that something? By the way, Kazu is the one guy I met ah. at 99. And um, he, uh, I loved starting the book with him because he was one of the first students at the Japanese language school. And he was also um, the first Nisei wounded in World War II which was in the summer of uh, 43 at the, in the Solomon Islands. He was, and by the way, the, the Nisei that served in the Pacific were in combat before the 442nd in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't in combat until the following year. So uh, Komodo was shot in the knee and was uh, evacuated uh, to um, you know, military hospital of Fiji. And Eleanor Roosevelt happened to be doing a tour of, of the South Pacific, stopping at hospitals. And Admiral Halsey was not really keen on being no, told that, not. that uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was coming for a visit, but boy, did he, did he end up appreciating what she was doing. And he wrote in his own uh, memoirs, he said, she stopped it not only in every hospital, but on every floor and at every bed. And, uh, you know, hundreds, literally thousands of of army uh, uh, guys who were wounded. And uh, so she came to uh, Kazu Komoto's uh, bedside and the doctor made, made sure that he introduced him and he explained he's one of the Nisei working for us. And um, uh, she did her usual thing, very motherly. She was very kind to the, the soldiers. And, and uh, he, Kazu was a very um, uh, humble and very quiet guy, but he was determined to say something to her. And he said, Mrs. Roosevelt, uh, uh, I am here uh, getting shot at and my family is back home in, in a camp. And that's a sore deal. And uh, she said, well, you know, the president uh, is doing everything he can, uh, you know, and I will relay your concerns. And, you know, of course, uh, by the way, Mrs. Roosevelt had already gone on the record and did soon after about starting to get some of those folks out of the camps if they could find jobs other than on the West Coast. So she had some sensitivity there and everything. Anyway, so, yeah, when we were doing the research on this, I said to my photo researcher, I said, you know, she was doing this big tour. I mean, a lot of pictures were taken. If there was a photo of, <laughs> and sure enough, there was, of her with him bedside. I want to just wrap with him real quickly. He went to this, back to California, was in the hospital there for a month or so before he was discharged. And uh, he got 30 days leave to go down and see his family in the camp in Arizona. And he got off the uh, bus uh, just outside of a little uh, a little town just outside of camp, decided he wanted to buy some fresh meats to, to take into the camp for his family. And he went into the and see the butcher in the back. And, and the guy looked at him and said, no, uh, no, no meat for Japs. I don't sell anything to Japs. And uh, Komodo said, I, I, I'm an American. 
And the butcher said, yeah, yeah, well, I'm an American. And uh, Komodo said, yeah, but I'm in uniform and you're not. And uh, I want you to sell me something. And he had on his Purple Heart. He's the first Purple Heart award winner for the Nisei. And it was as if the butcher saw him for the first time and looked over and saw him and said, all right, what is it you want? But he, this is an example of these guys were fighting two wars. They were fighting one war overseas against the enemy of this country. And he was. they would come home with medals, with wounds, and they were fighting another war here in, in America against racism. If I can pile onto that, there was also for African-American soldiers in the Second World War, what they called the double V, two victories, victory over the enemy overseas, victory over racism at home. And that idea of the double V victory was in black newspapers uh, all across America. And, and it has its reflection yes. in this experience as well. Did any of these men worry about uh, encountering uh, friends, family members, schoolmates, on the battlefield, and, and did it in fact ever happen? Well, it certainly that? did. Those, uh, the Kibe who had gone to Japan, they had cousins. In some cases, they had brothers still in Japan. Yeah. They had family, they had classmates. And it was always something that they worried about was, I want to do my duty as a US soldier, but I hope I never have to face off against a brother or a cousin or a friend. Uh, and it, and it was, it was a, a, a dilemma. In fact, Ray Matsumoto, when the just after the war ended and they were interrogating a bunch of Japanese prisoners to before they sent them back to Japan, ended up ended up finding in his pool of of Japanese uh, captured Japanese soldiers his cousin and a brother, and he could have just as easily been out in the jungle fighting them. Mm. And he felt, thank God, I wasn't. You um, end with uh, here we go again, Tajihiro Higa. Higa. Yeah, Higa, Taka, Taka on Hiro. Okinawa. He's a particularly interesting case. Can you tell us about him? Yes, he is a particularly interesting guy. He was born in Hawaii, taken over to Okinawa at age two. Okinawa was, had been annexed by Japan about 80 years earlier. And it Japan had taken over the education system, the government, everything. And they were teaching in school Japanese. And they actually outlawed the Okinawan dialect because they wanted everyone to speak Japanese. And so he was there for until he was about 18. And so he got to familiar with both Japanese and of course knew Okinawan. And at that point, the Japanese were, were drafting all the Okinawan uh, boys, young, young men to send them over to China. And uh, he didn't want to fight for the Japanese. So he was able to get back to Hawaii and thank God he did, it was about a year before. Pearl Harbor. And then when um, war broke out and he ended up uh, being recruited uh, by the military intelligence service for the language group. And what he, the one fear he had is take, send me anywhere in the Pacific, but not Okinawa. Well, guess where he ended up going. Uh, and the way it happened was he was in the Philippines with his division and they were planning a, the, the, the last invasion really of the Pacific, which was Okinawa. Somebody told the bosses in headquarters that they had a soldier who was raised on Okinawa. They had uh, Takahiro come in. He walked into the intelligence room that had all the maps on the wall and he saw a big map of Okinawa on the wall. And they started asking him questions. They showed him aerial photography and they said, see, we're concerned about these fortifications on the beach. We're gonna have to take them out. And they showed him and he looked at him. He said, those are burial tombs. You know, Okinawans spend more money on their burial tombs than they do their homes. And they like them on the hillside with a view of the, of the ocean. And you don't have to bomb the tombs. That's okay. Well, look at these pictures. There's fortifications in the corner of every farmer's field. These must be machine gun nests. You know, and Takahiro looked at him and went, oh, no. He says, Okinawan farmers always have piles of manure in their fields. You don't have to bomb those. And they said, you know what? You're going to come in every day and help us plan this invasion. So for 30 days, he was in there every day. And of course, he had very mixed feelings about this. But at the same time, you know, he, he so anyway, he ended up when the invasion happened was in the, again in the, in the first, you know, in the first wave, praying that he didn't have to shoot anybody, honestly. And uh, uh, he started almost immediately being summoned to the caves, these huge caves where these civilians, 200 at a time, 300 families, women, children, old men were going into. The Japanese had told him that if the Americans come, they're savages, they will 
they will kill you, they will torture you, they will hang you, they will do all kinds of terrible things. You're better off to uh, choose your own time and commit suicide. And these these folks were going in, these civilians were going in these caves and blowing themselves up. And there's horrific stories of young women holding on their babies, jumping off cliffs. And uh, Takahiro and the other language, uh, Nisei language guys were being summoned to go to the front of these caves and with a bullhorn, try to talk, talk them out of coming out. And Takohiro was there one day with his bullhorn, and he said, he's always said the same thing every day, every time. He said, I'm an Okinawan boy. I'm in the U.S. Army. The Americans are not savages. We will care for you. I still have family here, this whole spiel. And he just did that for two or three weeks. His, his unit was later held to be responsible for saving about 100,000 lives. There are civilians that just came out of the cave. And I just want to end this with 50 years later, Takahiro was now was living in uh, went living in Hawaii after the war. He returned to Okinawa, and um, a local newspaper did a story on him and what he had done during the war. And the next day, the re, after the story ran, a reporter the reporter called him and said, "There's somebody who'd like to meet you." So they set up this meeting at a restaurant. He was there waiting, and this older woman came in with a younger woman and. They recognized him from the picture in the paper and they came over and sat down and introduced themselves. And the older woman said, you know, I was I was a girl in one of those caves. And I remember what you told us, that you were an Okinawan boy. And I saw that in the paper and I knew that that was you. And I just wanted to thank you because I I, I wouldn't have this life if it hadn't been for you. And the younger woman said, and I am her daughter and I wanna thank you too because I wouldn't have my life if it hadn't been for you. And Takahiro went home, to, back to Hawaii, thinking that he really accomplished what he set out to do. He did his duty as a US soldier, but he also saved lives and saved Okinawans. There's some questions here from the audience. Um, I'm gonna start with this one. Uh, were there any incentives given to the Nisai to volunteer uh, for better treatment for their family, early release? Uh, Unfortunately, no. I mean, the the, re the incentives were were personal. One, they, they did it to prove their loyalty. Two, they did it to get out of the camp. And um, they were they were ready. They were ready to do what they could do to win the war and try to get back and get their families out of the camp. But no, there was no no privileges given. Were there any examples of Americans uh, Nisai who were recruited and then proved sympathetic to the Japanese? Absolutely not. Nope. Were they able to benefit from the GI Bill afterward? Yes. Oh yes, they were veterans. I mean they. They had all the rights and privileges of, of veterans, uh, disability if they were wounded and whatnot. You already addressed this uh, about the soldier uh, who crawled forward with two hand grenades, one for himself in case he was captured. But this particular question is, were any captured? Not that I was able to find. And uh, uh, so the answer is that to that is no. However, uh, there, there were some friendly fire incidents that did happen. I have one of them in the book. Of, and it was at the end of the Philippines campaign and and he was sent, Frank Hachia was sent, uh, summoned by a group of American soldiers to go into the hills to try to talk this, this group of Japanese soldiers into surrendering. The campaign was pretty much over in the Philippines and they just wanted to get them out of the field. So he went out there and talked to them and had a conversation and then he turned around and was coming back to the lines and he was shot in the stomach. Uh, it was one of the American, and it was it was not on purpose. Well, yeah, they it wasn't because they were they thought he was the enemy. Is what I'm trying to say. And he was coming back to a group that didn't know him. And uh, the real tragedy he died. He was mortally wounded. Died four days later. That very week, the American Legion in his hometown of Hood River, Oregon, removed his name and the names of 16 other Nisei soldiers who were serving. Uh, from their honor roll, which is on a billboard as you entered, as you enter town, remove them from 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 that listing, and um, and and the uh, head of the chamber of commerce wrote a uh, column that week saying, uh, any of you Japanese Americans who are serving now, don't come back. We don't want you at, in Hood River, Oregon. Was that ever repaired? 
it was a few months later when they got national publicity out ah. and all that they restored the names. Here's a question about uh, the Kibai, if I said that correctly. Kibai, uh, yeah. Kibai. Um, it takes a certain amount of resources to send, uh, I don't know, a 10 year old child to Japan and how, what kind of financial resources were necessary to make that possible? Well, these weren't rich families that did this, uh, but they did save enough for the for the boat trip, and then they went to live with relatives. And uh, so, you know, and it wasn't it wasn't that only the the well the well healed went over. No, not at all. They were farm families, basically. Um, this is probably a good one to end on. Uh, is there? Do you did you come across? Did you find anywhere in your interviews or research what the Japanese American soldiers? thought or felt about the atomic bombs? Oh, yeah, that's um, that's a big question. In fact, Ray Matsumoto, Roy Matsumoto's family is is his parents and his grand his parents moved back to Japan at some point before the war. And his his grandparents were there and they were he felt really um, good that they were in this small town on the coast instead of in uh, Tokyo, which was being bombed. And of course, that that town was Hiroshima. And uh, when the the bomb went off, he was sure that his family had been killed. Um, and it wasn't until he interviewed his, um, he interrogated his cousin and brother a few months later that he found out his his parents and grandmother had gone out in the country to visit some other relatives and they weren't there that day. Um, for the most part, uh, I, I, you know, I think that these guys understood and accepted as most of the fellows who were fighting over there at the time that it was necessary or what it could have to invade the island of Japan could have cost a million American lives and even more Japanese yeah, lives. Yeah. Um, and I think that's how they felt. Okay. I'm gonna end with the last question that is a personal question. Somebody wants to know what inspired you to become an author? Ooh, that's been a long time. <laughs> well, I started as a newspaper reporter. Right. Um, and, uh, and then I got into magazines and, uh, and then each transition from there. And then I wanted to spend more time uh, on a story, you know, then you get the two hours as on a newspaper and then I could spend two weeks when I was a magazine writer and then I wanted to spend a year. Of course, now I'm writing books that I spend four years yeah. on. But, um, and for me, it's always about, I want to tell real stories about real people. I, I'm not writing fiction, ever interested in that. I'm just, I'm still the, the newspaper guy at heart, I think, you know, being the journalist and wanting to go out and do that. And I, and I love it and I'm, yes. I'm blessed. This is long form journalism. That's right. Really long, very form long journalism. form. My wife says, "Does every book have to be about the whole war? Can't you do? Can't you just do one about a battle or a campaign?" So, okay, Cat, are you there? Yeah, I see you. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much to Craig Simons and Bruce Henderson for that wonderful talk. Um, thank you as well to Jim Basker and as well to um, Louis Lerman for tuning in via live stream and our audience. Uh, as a reminder, we do have our speakers books for sale in the museum store on the 77th side of the building, um, as well as books from the other finalists for the prize. Thank you so much for coming and we hope to have you back again soon.